Okay, Genesis 15. Starting in verse 7, all the way to 21. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land. From the river of Egypt to the river, to the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, uh, the, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. May the Lord bless the preaching of His, this, his word this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful Lord's Day that you have given us, a day to receive your blessings and your word of grace. Today, you will comfort, encourage, sanctify, and strengthen us through the preaching of the gospel. Lord our God, our Savior and King, we ask for your blessing upon the preaching of your holy and infallible word. Forgive my sins. Forgive the sins of your people. Wash us. Cleanse us by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. Direct my heart, my mind, my tongue, and my whole being that I may deliver your word to your beloved children, according to your sovereign and gracious will. Make your people's hearts ready, willing, and able to receive, to understand, and to believe your word for our comfort and joy. And give us the grace to apply in our daily lives 
what you reveal and teach us this special day. Do this, our merciful God and Father, for the glory of your name and for the edification and well-being of this beloved congregation. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only Lord and complete Savior, Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, how was your, your week? Has it been hard? <laughs> Blessed? Painful? Have you been happy all week? Or unhappy? <laughs> how was it? Did you have a uh, peaceful week, a peaceful week, or did you have a turbulent one? Has it been busy, crazy, encouraging, discouraging, maybe mix, eh? Have you been battling with depression, loneliness? Anxieties, fears, uncertainties, stress, health issues, relational conflicts, dealing with people. Sorry, eh? <laughs> Financial problems, challenges. It's not easy. Life is hard. But there is good news in God's Word. And today, you will be comforted and strengthened by the preaching of God's Word. Abraham was a sinner like you and me. But God is merciful and gracious. He revealed Himself to Abraham. He revealed Himself to Abraham as the living God who promised to send the Deliverer, the Messiah. The Deliverer, the Messiah, will defeat Satan. And he will rescue his people from sin and death. And he will restore God's fallen creation. And that is the gospel that Abraham heard and believed. He knew that. Now, Trusting and obeying God does not mean that life will be free of troubles and dangers, right? Instead, the Bible teaches us that the life of faith leads to hardships and sufferings. Now, from Genesis 12, verse 1, if you read it from Genesis 12, verse 1 to Genesis 15, verse 5, over and over and over and over again, God confirmed and reconfirmed and assured and reassured Abraham of his great promises. Abraham needed a lot of encouragement because of the life that he lived in obedience to the God whom he believed and love and serve. You think about that. Why, why did God have to repeat over and over again those promises? That tells us that Abraham's struggle was very great. It was humongous. He was fearful and he was childless. It's been years and God's promise to give him a son has not yet been Fulfill. So, Abraham struggled greatly as a pilgrim of faith. And the Lord knew that. The Lord was watching over him. And God's love and kindness towards Abraham was beyond words. And so after reconfirming and reassuring Abraham of his covenant promises, our merciful and gracious God and Father set out to com comfort and strengthen him 
all the more. There was a lot of promises already from Genesis 12, 1 to, to uh, 15, 5, but there was a need for a covenant ceremony to comfort and strengthen Abraham. See? Because of our weakness, our confession says, right? The preaching of God's word is powerful and effectual. That's the main thing. But because of the weakness of our flesh, we need something to see and something to taste, right? So, something to feel, to touch. So, we have the, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, right? The covenant ceremony here is like that. The word of God was more than enough, but Abraham is weak like us, and he needed something to see confirm his faith, to strengthen his faith so that he can continue to trust the Lord and serve his purposes. Now, let's look at the text. Genesis 15, verse 7. Then he, God, said to him, Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. Now, that is strikingly similar, parallel to Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, the giving of the Ten Commandments, right? What did the Lord say there? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You see that? Genesis 15, 7, I am the Lord. Exodus 20, verse 2, I am the Lord. Exodus 15, 7, God said to Abraham, I brought you out of the, of Ur. Exodus 20, verse 2, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's a preamble and the prologue of the covenant covenant with Abraham and the covenant with Israel in Sinai. Both verses teach us beautifully and gloriously that God himself, God himself, his person and his saving work God himself, the Lord himself, is the rock-solid foundation of the covenant. And he is the foundation of our covenant assurance and security. Co meaning, the covenant cannot fail because the God who made it with us in Christ never fails. God said in both verses, Genesis 15, 7 and Exodus 20, verse 2, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Now, Lord is capitalized, right? All of them. L, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And when you see that in your Bible, it means that the Hebrew for that word, Lord, or God, if it's all capital, it means that it's Yahweh in Hebrew. And Exodus 3.14 teaches us that Yahweh means I am. I am that I am, or I am who I am. So God says, I am. That's my name. I am. That means that God is the one who is, right? He is. When he speaks about himself, he says, my name is I am. And when we talk to him, that Lord, you are, you are. <laughs> he is, right? He is the one who is. What does that mean? Well, it means that he exists all by himself. He is. He exists all by himself. He has life in himself. He has life all by himself. In fact, he is life. 
He is. He, he does not need anything. And he does not need anyone to exist. Does not need a heart like ours. Does not need blood. Does not need the gooey stuff inside this skull. Right? Does not need air. That's good, eh? Free anywhere in the world. Air. Right? If the Lord charges us for, you know, like, he puts a meter on our noses and charges us, we'll be in trouble. It's free. Thank you, Lord. And, uh, but the Lord does not need that. Does not need food. Does not need water. He is. He has life in himself. He exists all by himself. And that means that, well, he's the source, the fountain of all life. And that means that he is independent. Right? He does not depend on anything or anyone in order for him to exist. He is. Wow. Now, because God is independent, therefore he is dependable. We need to think a little bit now. All right? He is reliable. Now, let us look at ourselves. We are dependent creatures, right? We need food, we need water. I'm going to drink water now. <laughs> we need shelter, right? My kids, they depend on me. I love them. They depend on me for food, for water, shelter, electricity. I pay all that. I work and I pay all that. Give them a ride, clothes, education. They depend on me for like everything. That's not right. I'm just kidding. I love to serve my kids. But, you know, I'm not really dependable. What if I get sick and become handicapped? What if I die suddenly? Right? Because I am a dependent creature, therefore I am not really dependable. The one who is dependable, truly and completely dependable, is the one who is independent. Right? And God is independent. He is. He is life. He is self-existent. He is self-sufficient. He is independent. And therefore, he is totally, absolutely dependable, reliable. He will do what he says. Everything that he says, everything that he promises, he does them, accomplishes them. And he's unstoppable. That's what I am means. Dependable and therefore unstoppable. His plans cannot be thwarted. He cannot be frustrated. No one can. Who can stop? Yahweh. The great I am. No one. Right? That's why he starts the covenant with I am. Yahweh, who brought you out. And I'm giving you this land, and it's going to happen. I'm giving you a son, and it's going to happen. For sure. Guaranteed. God's person, character, guarantees it. So here was Abraham, a pilgrim, a stranger, in the land that God promised to give him, but still childless. It's been years we went through a lot. Egypt, that was traumatic beyond words. And then the separation with Lot. And then the war, and then the threats of the nations every day. 
was surrounded by hostile kingdoms and nations, overwhelmed with fear and great anxiety. He was in desperate need of comfort and strength. And then God told him, I am. God told him, I am. I am Yahweh, the self-existent one. Abraham, I am life. I have life in myself and all by myself. All life comes from me. I am not dependent on anyone or anything. Therefore, Abraham, believe it. Believe me. The fulfillment of my promises to you are not dependent on anything or anyone. The fulfillment of God's promises cannot be thwarted or made to fail. God told Abraham, Abraham, my child, I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. I cannot be stopped are frustrated. I was the one who brought you out of Ur, and I'm giving you this land, and I will give it to you. You will have it. I'll give you a son. You will have it. It's sure. It's guaranteed. Therefore, Abraham, cast all your fears away. Doubts, your worries, cast them away, Abraham. I am. It will come to pass. Doesn't depend on you, your performance, because Abraham was, right? Genesis 12 in Egypt is a sinner just like you and me. Doesn't depend on him. Doesn't depend on the nations or anything, political matters, health issues, financial matters. No, God's purposes shall be accomplished because God said it and he will do it. God told him, Abraham, trust me. Totally, perseveringly, because I will accomplish everything that I promised to accomplish for you. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, God's word to Abraham is his word of comfort and strength for you as well. You are like Abraham. You believe in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the seed of Abraham. And Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises that God made to Abraham. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ, right? Second Corinthians one twenty. But it's hard, isn't it? We live in a fallen world. We struggle constantly with fears and worries. As sojourners and exiles in this fallen world, we will always struggle with fears and worries. We will always suffer tribulations and persecutions. God's word to Abraham is God's word to us as well. Remember, your God is the great I am. All his promises are yes and amen in Christ. By faith, you are saved, justified, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. You are being sanctified and glorified. The Lord will the Lord is with you and He is for you. He'll never fail to take care of you and your family. He does not depend on the economy or who becomes the next president of the United States or this forces, this forces, that thing happening over there or in the other part of the world and this movement here and that movement there or this underground thing there underground, or whatever, right? You can trust the Lord. He is independent and therefore he is dependable. Now, Genesis 15, 18. We read there, on the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Made a covenant is literally cut a covenant. So we can read that as on that day the Lord cut a covenant with Abraham. This Cutting of the covenant is visually depicted 
in the cutting of animal sacrifices in half. And that's in Genesis 15, verse 9 and 10. So he had said, he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. So cut them and divided them. And then later on, in verse 17, it came to pass when the sun went down, it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between these pieces. So cut the animals into except the birds. And then a flaming torch, a burning pot, a flaming torch, passed through those pieces. The covenants are treaties. And there are formal agreements between two parties. Normally, it was between a rich and powerful king and a needy king. Let's say, for example, that Ohio is a kingdom, kingdom of Ohio, and then Pennsylvania is another kingdom, kingdom of Pennsylvania, and then New York is another kingdom. Okay? And you went through hard times, difficult times. Your people became very, very poor and needy. Huge depression and crises. Now, the kingdom of Ohio, for example, just for example, invaded you. And your king escaped to New York and asked the king of New York, New York for a treaty, a covenant. So if the king of New York agrees, then animals would be slaughtered. And then the king of New York will then pass through those slaughtered animals. And he's saying, king of Pennsylvania and the people of Pennsylvania, I am committing myself to you. I will send my forces and drive out those soldiers of the kingdom of Ohio out of your territory and I will protect you and I will help you get out of that financial crisis too, economic crisis. Now if I don't do that, I am passing through these slaughtered animals. If I don't, if I fail to fulfill what I promise in this covenant, let me be like one of these animals that was slaughtered, you see? So it's very serious. Get into a covenant, you have to do it. You have to fulfill it. Right? Now, the king of Pennsylvania will also pass through those pieces, those slaughtered animals, and say, and, and he, will not, he will not say that, but it will be equivalent to saying, king of New York, I submit myself to you. You, will, you shall be as a father to me, and I will, I will be loyal to you, and I will be your subject. If I fail to fulfill my obligation in this covenant, my duty, then let me be like one of these animals that was slaughtered that were slaughtered. See? So, brothers and sisters, the Lord used that ancient covenant ceremony to strengthen the heart of Abraham. God cannot die, right? But he used that to say, Abraham, if a king, two kings enter a covenant together, they have to, to be faithful to, that, to those promises that they make in the covenant. Otherwise, they're dead. Now, Abraham, I cannot die, right? But I am so much more serious than human beings who make those covenants, who cut covenants on earth. I'm more serious than them, and I am so much more committed to the promises that I give to my covenant people. Abraham, I'm going to do it. I will give you this land. I will give you a son. So, 
that was a great, great encouragement and comfort and edification for Abraham. Wow! Seeing those flaming symbols of the Lord, the presence of the Lord pass through that, he was deeply assured. God guaranteed the fulfillment of all his promises to Abraham through the covenant ceremony. Now, fast forward. 2,000 years later, in the upper room, our Lord, we read this in Luke 22, verse 19 and 20. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he, our Lord and Savior, broke it. See that? He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So you see that? The bread broken. Said, this is my body given for you. He's saying that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrifices. Right? He, he is the fulfillment of those slaughtered animals. In Genesis 15, they were cut in half and divided, separated. So he broke the bread and said, this is my body given for you. And then the cup, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Now, imagine those animals, right? How many animals were there? Damn, it was hard. Abraham did it. It was driving away the birds. And it was bloody. A lot of blood. Right? And Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Brothers and sisters, Christ is the fulfillment of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Like those slaughtered animals, Christ's body was broken and his blood was shed for the fulfillment of God's promises to save his people. He accomplished salvation for us through his sufferings and death. He paid for our sins, and God bound himself to us with a solemn oath. His gracious, God's gracious, sacred commitment to us was gloriously manifested and displayed on the cross. So, so you look at the cross, the Spirit tells us, he paid for your sins, right? He paid for your sins. Secondly, Genesis 15 tells us that body that was broken and that blood that was shed for you on the cross, that's the guarantee that God's covenant promises to save you and to give you your eternal inheritance in the new heaven and the new earth. Christ's body that was pierced and his blood that was shed, that's the guarantee. That all the promises of God for you are yes and amen. And there is no reason for you to doubt or be shaken or be uncertain about, is this thing real? You know? Or maybe people just invented that book. No, oh, look at the cross. God tells you there, I pay, he paid, my son paid for your sins. Secondly, he is the guarantee. In the same way that seeing those animals slaughtered and the flaming torch and the burning pot pass through it, that ministered to Abraham and told him, it's guaranteed, Abraham, it's guaranteed. You're going to have a son, I'll give you this land. I will fulfill everything. The Messiah will come, he will crush the serpent, he will rescue his people from sin and death, and he will restore the universe. That's going to happen, Abraham, because I promised it. And this is a covenant with you, my covenant, and I am the self-existent one. I am 
the great, the great I am was making the, the covenant with Abraham. Whew. There's no possibility of failure, even point zero 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 one. It's a hundred percent guaranteed. So God has given you His promise. You're like Abraham. Everyone who believes in Jesus shall not perish but have everlasting life. That is true. That is true. You will not perish. You, a believer of Christ, shall not perish but have everlasting life. He's coming again. Now, if you die before he comes again, he says, he has, he's preparing a room, a place for you in heaven. And where he is, where he is, there you will be also. And then, in his second coming, on his second coming, he will give us the new heaven and the new earth. This will be fulfilled. It doesn't depend on anything or anyone. God will do it. So, expel, cast away all doubts, fears, worries. Be rooted and grounded in the gospel. That's what God was doing with Abraham. He was preaching to him the gospel over and over and over and over from 12 verse 1 all the way throughout his life. Same thing with Isaac and Jacob. God telling them over and over and over. That's the gospel. God preaching to them the gospel. The gospel comforts us and strengthens us. It's our life. It's the bread for our soul, our nourishment. It's what we need. So you see, if your fears and worries and anxieties are like this, and you are overwhelmed and you are being overcome by that, the problem is your knowledge of the gospel in your mind and in your heart is maybe like this. That's why it's, you see that? So you need more of the gospel, right? Heard. That's why we have to go to church every Sunday. We have two services. You need to hear the gospel over and over and over and over and over again. She didn't get tired of it. It's our food. It's our sustenance. It's the air that we breathe. And then you need to see it, right? That's why we baptize our children and new believers. Because the sacraments are symbols. Visible signs and symbols that preach the gospel to us. It confirms our faith, strengthens our faith. So we have communion. And it's a special day when we do that. It's like Genesis 15, the broken body, the shed blood. Now his was animals, and he was encouraged, right? Animal flesh and animal blood. And and Abraham was strengthened. Now, with us, it's the eternal Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior. It's not animal flesh and animal blood. It's the body of the Lord Jesus Christ broken for us and His blood shed for us. How much more comfort and strength that gives us we live in better days, right? A better covenant. And so, increase your intake of the gospel. Teach them to your kids. Preach it to yourself. Don't stop those daily devotions. Don't stop going to church twice on Sundays. We need more of the Word. More of the Word. Not less and less and less. Amen. May the Lord continue to bless you with greater and deeper knowledge, not just in the mind, but also in the heart of what Christ accomplished for you on the cross of Calvary and how sure and guaranteed your salvation and eternal inheritance is. Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Oh God, we thank you that you are our God and our King and our Father. And you have established your covenant with us. You sent the Lord Jesus Christ 
to pay for our sins, to save us. And Lord, thank you for your sacrifice for us. Thank you for your prayers in heaven for us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you sent to regenerate us, to convert us. And now he sanctifies us and preserves us. And Lord, thank you for your promise of eternal life, of eternal inheritance in the new heaven and the new earth. Oh God, you are glorious beyond words. We thank you that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. We praise you. Lord, bless your children here in Carbondale. Oh God, continue to preserve the pure preaching of the gospel in this pulpit. Oh God, Lord, let your people be saturated by the Word of God, rooted and grounded in the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nourish them, O Lord. Comfort them, O God. Strengthen them. Help them in all their struggles, In all the problems, oh God, the trials and tribulations of life, health issues, family conflicts, relational problems, financial setbacks, Lord, be with them as you have been with Abraham, as you have been with Christ while he was here on earth as you have been with the apostles and all your people throughout the ages. We thank you that you never fail. We thank you that in you, in Christ, because of his death and resurrection, our salvation and eternal inheritance in heaven, it is guaranteed. Let your people receive the peace and the rest of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen.